there's this thing with surfing that every moment before you get into the barrel is terrifying. Like you gotta pick the right wave, you gotta position yourself, and then you gotta make this crazy drop down the wave. And then you get inside the barrel, and if you do everything right, you know you're gonna come out. Like that's the hard part's done, and the next bit's easy. And for sort of two or three seconds, you get to stand back, just surrounded by the ocean, all the energy, and it's unbelievable best feeling I'd ever felt in my life and I was I was hooked Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got Mark Matthews in the house. Good to see you, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me, Lewis. I'm great. Uh, just heard about you recently from the person who connected us and said, I, you have an amazing story. You're this big wave surfer. surfer. Uh, and I started watching some of your videos, and I saw some of the biggest crashes ever. And I was like, how does this guy first do it? And how does he have the courage to continue to get up after these, like, four, it looks like 40-foot waves? I don't know how big are some of these waves you've, done, you've been on. I'd say the biggest ones in the 40 to 60 really? foot range. Yeah. And then anywhere from sort of 20, 20 feet up is what we consider big waves. Big wave, 20 feet up. How often do you hit those waves? Because it's not happening like every day. It kind of comes and goes when the weather's changing, right? Or how does that work? Exactly. And originally it was probably three to four swells a year. But since really? swell forecasting has got so amazing, the internet opened up like a whole new world of forecasting. We can hit probably... 15 to 20 big swells a year so which is awesome for my career but then all of a sudden i got a whole lot more dangerous surfing yeah so many big waves yeah here. more risk yeah now is that all in one um beach or is that like around the country in australia or is that all around the world and you're just like you can predict in two days it's going to be huge so you fly there how does that work all over the world yeah. and and if we get a, a seven day forecast <laughs> really? and i'll know that at the end of the week, I'll be surfing monster waves, and it might be off really? the bottom of South Africa, the bottom of Australia, Tahiti, here in America on the West Coast. So, so you'll get advanced, and you'll fly there, and you'll just go. Fly there, and, and sort of about two days out, we make the decision to get there as late as possible because then we know what the winds and the weather's doing. Sure. We know the swell's already on the way, wow. but we need perfect winds and, and weather conditions as well. So two days out, we jump on the plane, land usually the night before the swell, Get everything ready, jet skis, other surfers, photographers, videographers, <laughs> and uh, head out there and, out and there. take it on. Early morning usually is when it's like the best time or what? Yeah, more often than not early morning because yeah. it's the light winds are good. But, wow. Uh, yeah, occasionally we can get a, an entire day and, and sometimes back-to-back -back days. But yeah. more often than not, we get a, one huge day as well and then it, it starts to drop off. And didn't you have like a record for like one of the biggest waves or something? Or I've uh, or I had a record where I've won consecutive awards for the biggest wave of the year and i, I won really? that back to back three times so at biggest the time wave of the year yeah and at wow. the time i was kind of I, I didn't realize how amazing goal it was but then i went sort of five <laughs> years without winning one i was like wow it's kind of special that it's i did that, that you know yeah because there is there's a lot of hard work a lot of preparation but there's a lot of luck involved yeah because you're out there in the surf you do everything to prepare to get out there and surf but then while you're out there, there's other surfers. You don't know exactly when the biggest wave on that gonna day is going to come through. Yeah, you took one too soon, exactly. and then it happened after you're gone. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. So I feel like wow. someone was shining down on me at that point. I was <laughs> like good, really man. lucky. So you you uh, hit those waves. Now, what I mean, how many people are going to these big waves every time they happen? Is there like a group of like twenty of you in the clan, like the brotherhood, or? You know, the sisterhood, I don't know, that goes there. And it's like every time there's a big wave, you guys all go together. Do you try to do it secretively so you can, like, hit those opportunities? What's that like? It's a combination. Yeah. Like, on one hand, we have to be kind of secretive because you want to be the one on the big wave, right, right. you know. But everyone's watching the same forecast. So usually we'd have sort of a minimum of two or three teams that, that turn up to swells mm. and, and then a max, sometimes in the crowded spots like of Hawaii, off Maui at yeah. Jaws, we could have 20 teams out there and a combination of majority guys, but also some amazing really? female big wave surfers. Yeah, wow. so It's a pretty cool vibe out of the water while we're on one hand kind of competing to sure, get the sure. biggest wave, mm -hmm. but everyone's there You're looking after each other. Each other. Yeah, because... Bad stuff happens every time. Every time. There, when you have that many people in huge waves. There's big wipeouts all the time. 
And it's scary. There's not a lot of uh, sort of rescue teams in the water. It's more up to the surfers who are out there to rescue each other. So, That's crazy. Yeah, it's really? pretty crazy. So you, you got to keep an eye out for the other people because you want them to keep an eye out yeah, for you of as course. well at the same time. So when you get a uh, crash in a 40-foot wave, how long does it take for you to actually get out and breathe? Because um, it looks like one of the videos I saw was just like you, you're just down. You can't even see you for like – seems like minutes i don't know but you're just like tumbling in this huge wave i mean how do you get out of that it, it's crazy because it looks so spectacular but more often than not you're up before 20 seconds really yeah well, which isn't good. a long time worst case scenario is you go you wipe out on one big wave and you're down and you can't get up and the next wave breaks so you're down for two waves and then you're looking at sort of 45 mm. seconds to a minute but um i mean we do breath hold training yeah and I can hold my breath up to sort of four or five minutes when I'm relaxed. But when you got the when chaos, you wipe out, you flip yeah. around, it's probably So when not you wipe easy. out on these waves and you take impact and That's you get so winded hard. and the adrenaline's rushing, you don't know if you're going to make it back up, it's uh, 20 seconds feels like a lifetime underwater. Feels like forever. Forever. Was there ever a time where you felt like, I'm not going to get out? There's been a couple of bad ones. Uh, for me, the scariest part is hitting the reef below. Yeah. And, and if you take impact on the reef and you know you've done a bad injury, so... Uh, a couple of years ago, I dislocated my shoulder and I felt it on the first impact of the wipeout. And then I had to kind of nurse my arm oh my because gosh. it was popped out. No, had, underwater. Yeah, and I was rolling around like no, I was on the craziest no. sort of roller coaster ride ever oh. underwater and, and holding on, dealing with the pain, trying not to pass out. Popped up and, and what happens is the jet ski will come in quick on the next wave to try and pull you out before the next one breaks right. on you unluckily he came Missed. on on my uh, left side so i couldn't grab because that's no. the shoulder that was out tried to grab right side slipped off the ski and the next wave breaks straight on my head another 40 foot wave on top of my head with the shoulder out so because he had to get out of the way he then, had right? to get out of the way oh, yeah so gosh. i had to take two more waves before he was able to come back and oh, get me miserable. that that was one of the scariest sort of moments i've, I've had to face and then a year was it a year ago when you had this pretty bad leg, leg accident right yeah so i've had a, what uh, happened to that i've one? had a bad run um i was recovering from the shoulder injury i was out for about nine months yeah. just starting to surf again i could barely paddle oh. properly but desperate to get into some good waves and at the same time i've got a career i'm getting paid money yeah, to surf big waves you yeah do it. and um and for me i felt like you know i, I need to do something this year you know because i've got uh, contracts coming up probably pushed a little bit too soon went out and, and surfed not huge waves but <clears throat> what we describe as a, a slabbing wave. So What's it's that? sort of like a head high to sort of 10 foot wave breaking really thick, powerful wave breaking super shallow water. Ooh, so that scary. to me, these are the really scary waves. Uh, went out there too early, was nervous about my shoulder, uh, just made an error judgment, wrong wave, dove off the wave too early. The wave picked me up and slammed me into the reef. What happened was I, I luckily landed on my feet, took all the impact on my feet, but my knee dislocated. Oh. Yeah, so uh, it popped, tore through my arteries, tore through my major nerves. Um, thankfully, amazing jet ski drivers and rescue guys picked me up out of the water, got me to the beach. Uh, ambulance officers met me and made the right call. They, they called the helicopter to come and pick me up and get me to the ER fast. as fast as possible. Because they could have very easily said, we'll take you, you know, you're not in too serious a damage, you might have broken your leg. But uh, he realized that my leg was swelling really quickly yeah, and that was the broken something. artery. Yeah, and my leg was filling up with blood. So got me there, got surgery and, and the surgeon came out and said, you know, an hour later your leg would have had to be been amputated. So I was, and it was kind of a three day wait. He was like, I've fixed it. We have to wait for the next three days to see if your pulse comes back in your foot, which oh means gosh. the artery's working. So for the next three days, just wait, I'm praying. Oh man, it was terrifying. I was like looking at my foot the whole time, and and <laughs> you couldn't move your foot, right? Yeah, and my girlfriend was there with me. She'd be like checking every hour to see if the pulse had come back, and because uh, you didn't have a pulse in your foot. No, so just the blood dead. wasn't pumping. Yeah, and couldn't then, move it. It was like paralyzed essentially. Completely paralyzed. And then um, oh my kind gosh. of around the third day, it, it started to pull a real weak light pulse. And my girlfriend was like, wow, I can feel something. I can feel it. And I was like, are you sure? And then got the doctors in and they checked it out. And, and luckily, I've, I've wow, still got man. my leg. Yeah. Crazy. It's, it's not as good gar- as a 
perfectly functioning leg, but it's, it's a pretty there. gnarly scar. Can you can you lift it up? Can we see it from the side a little bit? <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're eating at home, <laughs> yeah. you might want to oh put your gosh. food down. Oh my gosh! I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. Can I touch it or no? Yeah, you can touch it. It's all numb. I, I have no feeling oh, in my legs. Oh man, it's so. just like straight to the bone yeah. and like it's gross. Oh my gosh! So that's from the surgery, or that's from the this is from the surgery, not from hitting the the reef. No, so there was no uh, actual break in the skin from the injury, but. What they had to do with the surgery was when they took some artery from the top of my leg and put it down here, and then they had to take the pressure off my leg, so they cut both sides of my leg open. Oh. And uh, they had to keep it open for a month no. with a, yeah, a vacuum bag stuck on it. No. Yeah, and then they relieve all the swelling while that artery heals. So oh, my gosh. It was a, it was a, so your it was a rough leg period. was cut open on both sides, yep. like a foot long. Yeah. How do you, you can't walk then, can you? No, I was laid up in hospital. For a month. For a month and then wow, this another two happening. months after that. Is yeah. it safe to be like exposed when it's cut open it's like that? Actually, the most dangerous part is the infections yeah. in the hospital. They had a girl in there who was a rugby player, a really good rugby player. She had the same sort of injury and uh, she got really bad infections. And mm. for for six months, um, she was stuck in hospital trying to heal the infections. Wow. Because you can then... It really is. It'll yeah, kill leg. you. Yeah, or I was lose your leg, kill you. Yeah. Super lucky. I didn't um, didn't get the infections. I, I, I mean, I, I've learned so much sort of up until this period in my career about sort of managing health and um, mm -hmm. emotion and and not letting myself get run down in that moment. I think that played a big part in the way my nervous system and my immune really? system was functioning while I was in in hospital and and I, I think that that's a, a big reason really? I didn't get the um. What were you Infection. doing emotionally or mentally to prepare yourself daily to not, I guess, stress out constantly? Yeah, because it was a really tough time. The doctors were telling me, you, you're not going to walk properly ever again. You're not going to surf ever again. And um, it was tough to hear. So how do you like have this dream, these yeah. hopes and this belief? And well, you're like, well. I, I've always had this, um, like I, I've learned over time, this amazing technique of just practicing gratitude, mm. right? It's so powerful, yeah. and it was tough to do at the start. I'm not so gonna lie, hard. I was like, <laughs> I'm lying in hospital. I was in the worst pain all day, every day. I could barely Ugh. sleep. Not much to be grateful about at no. that point in You're time. Alive. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. What happened was, what is there? A young kid came. He he had seen that I was in hospital, and he was actually in hospital downstairs. And he comes into my room. He's complete quadriplegic. Oh. Yeah, and like electric chair wheels into my room comes up he just wanted to chat because he was a surfer and he saw on my social media that i was in there no way comes in to chat to me and like it straight away complete change in the way i perceived my situation because all of a sudden i was the luckiest man on earth yeah that i wasn't in his chair he was you know? a surfer he was a surfer yeah like not not a, a professional surfer but a surfer yeah he had actually did it <clears throat> um mountain bike riding that's how he got yeah. injured. oh he broke his neck and um yeah, and, and just seeing that completely changed my mindset. So yeah. from that day on, I was happy every day in that hospital. Yeah. And and the times where I drift back, I would just think about that. Like he, he really helped me. It was crazy. Mm. I remember a couple of years ago, I was I, I trained with the uh, USA National Handball Team. Mm -hmm. I play handball. And we were down at training camp for a week in Alabama. And we were going through like two, three days training, but doing some stuff that, I didn't feel like we had a specific trainer that was leading us through workouts. Yeah. It wasn't our coach. It was like a hired trainer. And for me, playing sports my whole life, playing at a professional level, I just knew the things that he was doing were not professional. Yeah. Like it was hurting us more than helping us. We were all getting Such like a injured. Hard part of, it was of like, you got to keep pushing. And I was like, no, I'm getting hurt now. Yeah. And everyone else is getting hurt. And everyone's like, yeah. but you don't want to be that one to exactly. say, like, so you got to like team. push it through. Yeah, and you're right. like, okay, whatever. And I remember just being like, what am I doing here? This is stupid. Like I'm exhausted. And then literally like at the other end of the court, there were these, these guys and girls that came in on wheelchairs playing wheelchair basketball. And I was just like, put me in that perspective as well. Exactly. I was like, they're all playing. They can't walk and they're having fun playing basketball, even though this sucks. And I don't think it's right. Like, at least I can walk yeah. and run through the pain. It's crazy. So I think it's all about perspective. perspective. Yeah. It's perspective huge. is unbelievable. And there's, I feel like no matter how bad you got it, there's always someone yeah. got it worse. And if you can sort of condition yourself mm -hmm. to think that way with that positive perspective and a bit of gratitude, like you can train yourself to be, that's yeah. your yeah. new state of mind consistently, like, right? Mm -hmm. It's like going to the gym. You just got to do it over and over and over again. And then it becomes habitual. That's and it, man. Yeah. To me, I think 
action taken from that sort of mind frame, like it's like it creates energy and then action taken from there is, is propelling, you know, yeah. like gives you so much extra motivation to sort of chase your dream. Absolutely. Now, why'd you get into big wave surfing in the first place? Because it's been 15 years you've been doing this, right? Yeah. Um, Weren't you afraid to, of the, the ocean when you were going out? Terrified when I was young, mm-hmm. which is strange. I mean, I show people footage and photos of what I do for a living, and they're certain that I must have been <laughs> kind of born with some sort of brain defect <laughs> that stops yeah. me from feeling fear, but um, yeah. couldn't be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. Like, I, uh, young boy, terrified the ocean to the point where my mum used to have to rescue me over and over again in the surf. And I, I grew up in a, a pretty rough neighborhood in Sydney. And uh, when your mum paddles out on her bodyboard <laughs> to rescue you in not, front of all these guys, cool. oh man, it's so embarrassing. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> my parents split when I was about 15 and I lived with my mum and we moved mm. right next door to another professional surfer whose name was Kobe Abernon. And at the time, I mean, I was 15, he was probably 20 and I was looking at his lifestyle. <laughs> he was like coolest cars hottest girlfriends <laughs> getting paid to travel around the world go surfing and i was just like all i want is that mm. i'm gonna copy everything he does to get that you know and uh but i was terrified of the ocean at the time at 15, still. yeah wow. yeah still then so i i wanted to be the professional surfer but not specifically big waves i like there's a competitive tour that you can go and mm-hmm. do and become the world champion <clears throat> and it's super lucrative. Yeah. And, and you can kind of avoid surfing the huge waves, right? They're like eight foot waves. Yeah. Like it's standard. It's more performance. Yeah. Who's the top guy? Kelly. Kelly Slater. Slater yeah, yeah. One of the most amazing athletes in the planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my goal. But I got to the point where I, I left school. It was about 2001. And I wasn't doing that well on the competitive tour. I was in that that sort of transition period where I'm chasing my dream but I don't know if it's going to work out I've got to go back and study or yeah. you know, start a new career and I get a call from the editor of a, of a surfing magazine Australia Tracks magazine it's like this is back when magazines existed yeah. right? and it was the biggest publication in Australia and I'm working bars as a uh, barista sort of slash bartender and, and I get this call from him and I can't believe he's called me because I'm a no one right at this point in surfing mm-hmm. And he rings me up. <clears throat> he says, Mark, you know, we want you to come and surf this new wave that's been found off the bottom of Tasmania. Like at that time, there was this rumor going around the surf industry. A new wave. Wow. Monster new wave that fishermen and abalones had, had found. Wow. Yeah, no one had surfed yet. And it sounded terrifying. <laughs> no part of me wanted yeah, to deal like with it. Yeah, it's like this mythological <laughs> creature that like no one's seen. No one, no one's yeah. seen it. And uh, so the surf editors rang me up and invited me on the Why trip. Why did they ring you up? Yeah, this is what I didn't understand. I found out later that he had rung 30 other surfers. Oh, and wow. like my name was at the bottom of the list. Like, Maybe this kid's yeah. crazy yeah. enough. He's desperate <laughs> like everyone enough to- had turned it down. I wanted to turn it down too. But yeah. I was like, if I say no to this, my career's done. This is kind of my final shot. And he was like, we'll put it on the home page. Yeah, the cover oh, it's of the like magazine. cover of the magazine. Like, this like- is before like websites were big and stuff. This was and big. Yeah, cover of magazines, huge. So I said yes. Went to Tasmania, we're taken out by a, a abalone diver, like fisherman, in his boat, super remote corner of wow. Tasmania, monster swell. And uh, we pulled up alongside this wave and it was so big and scary looking. And I'm sitting in the boat, never surfed anything like this. Like, I was terrified. I remember I'm sitting there just thinking, like the photographers are like, you know, this is your big chance. Your career <laughs> like, can ta- Maybe and, I'll die though. Yeah, but I was like, I don't know how much I want this career right now, like to, to go and surf there. <clears throat> At the time, I was living with my mum and my mum was really sick. She had a, it's not a, a serious illness. It's called vertigo. Uh-huh. But when it's undiagnosed, like back then, it's you can't get out of bed, you can't walk, you can't do anything. She was in bed, she had been in bed for three months and hadn't been able to work. And the doctors couldn't tell what was wrong with her. Right. And, and at that time, I was like, if that doesn't get better, I'm the only one to look after her, you know. And I had this in my head, you know, I have to look after my mom. And that was like the, the urgency to do that was the only thing that got me out of the boat to surf that wow. day. Because I was like, if I get this career, then there's the, the goal camera. right there. Yeah. I went out and surfed by far the biggest waves I've ever surfed. And not only stayed I surfed, up stayed up and fell in love with it it was like the best feeling in the world like standing inside barreling waves as big as this room like and and there's this thing with surfing that 
every moment before you get into the barrel is terrifying. Like you've got to pick the right wave, you've got to position yourself and then you've got to make this crazy drop down the wave and then you get inside the barrel and if you do everything right, you know you're going to come out. Like that's the hard part's done and the next bit's easy and for sort of two, three seconds, you get to stand back just surrounded by the ocean, all the energy and is unbelievable. Best feeling I'd ever felt in my life. Wow. And I was like, I was hooked. I was hooked. The the um, photos from that trip went all around the world. Covers of magazines, mainstream media, everything. Got my first surfing sponsorship. Like signed on the dotted line probably a month later. Like it took a long time for the photos to come out and right. get to sign on the dotted line. All of a sudden I was getting paid to surf. Really? Yeah. And Just I had from the, one photo. One, or like photos Couple. from that trip, but all over the world, like everywhere. All of a sudden I was a huge name in surfing and, and wow. the sponsors came straight away. And, right away. Yeah. From one trip, you can one make trip, tons of money. It just changed everything. Because like now one they want you to, way, Yeah, that's, that's how important it is. Like That's one why wave. we try and surf every big swell because then you can get that career-defining wave. Like You have to be there every time just in case that wave comes through. It's crazy. And then hopefully someone takes the photo. Exactly. Because <laughs> then you're like, did you get that? Yeah. No. And back in ah. those days, it was like film cameras. Yeah, yeah. Like, so guys would be changing film while you get the best wave no. of your life and they'd miss it. So. Oh my god. At least that part of technology has made what just, we do way easier. Yeah, just snap a photo of your <laughs> yeah. phone now. Yeah. Wow, man. And then I, I mean, I had the blueprint of how to, how to be a professional surfer now big wave surfers chase the biggest waves get yeah. the get the photos get the exposure and get bigger sponsorships were people doing big wave surfing back then as a main thing was it like it had had kind of just this started wasn't, wasn't as a Laird, career like yeah the one who kind of pioneered he, it? he was the pioneer I've and he was well. yeah, yeah I, I watched his episode yeah, yeah. Great. He, he was the the pioneer of not only surfing a lot of the major big waves around but making a career out of it right like he he was a visionary in that part because he sort of stepped away from the the way the traditional industry worked and created this amazing career out of big wave surfing. He realized that broad audiences would love what he's doing, not just the the sort of small niche surf community. So uh, yeah, I kind of he was one of my my heroes, and I I kind of followed everything he was doing in That's his career, cool. and I thought. If he can do it, I can do it. But it was tough with him because he's just like built like yeah. this huge, he's a man. yeah, you know I mean? big Greek god or something. Yeah. So I was kind of like, if he can do that, maybe I can do a little bit. <laughs> but wow. yeah, it what's was the, awesome. What's the biggest wave recorded that someone surfed? Do we know? Um, I think they they debate over it all the time because everyone wants that hundred foot wave and hundred feet. Yeah, I, I I'm pretty sure it's kind of in the eighty to hundred foot range. Really? Yeah. What's and the highest you've done? it'd be 70 feet, like 70, 80 feet. There's kind of two different parts. There's parts where you get towed in by a jet ski and put onto huge waves. Mm -hmm. So there's that side of surfing, but then there's also the paddle side of surfing. That's and then hard. that's sort of in the 30 to foot range, but yeah. a whole lot harder to do. Yeah, and sure. kind of, you can get really, really smashed when you're towing in the jet ski because you put in positions that are not sort of, <laughs> you can't get there humanly possible. No, it's impossible. So you have yeah. to deal with the wipeouts there, but it's a lot easier to do. Yeah. And then there's the paddle side of surfing that's sort of 30 foot range. Wow. And there, there's two spots in the world um, off Jaws. Uh, Jaws in Maui. Uh -huh. The reef off Maui is one of the main spots and has been for a long time where it sort of Laird launched his yeah. career. And then now, recently in Portugal, a wave called Nazare, which has this crazy deep water canyon that runs out from the beach. Mm and seems to magnify swells and wow. they've been riding now waves down there sort of in the 80 foot range that's yeah. crazy dude maybe a bit bigger just yeah. watching those waves with no one on them is probably oh it's terrifying it's almost worse with someone on them because then you get the scale of actually how big it is they're just so tiny huh terrifying wow yeah so let's talk about fear then because how do you embrace the the concept of fear especially you know before you got injured after you got injured you know anytime when you're going out how do you I guess, get yourself ready, prepared for a big moment when you're terrified of the ocean. It's tough. What you, <laughs> I'm not what's, your, lie. what's your process like? And um, for how, me, how could think, people think about fear in their own way? I think you got to break down fear first. There's, there's two kind of specific types. There's physical fear, mm -hmm. physical damage, injury, and dying, of course. And then there's that sort of egoic fear, you know, like failure, uh, embarrassment like all these things and the surprising thing they feel exactly the same there's sort of no difference to the way your body reacts and being a I might not come across like it but I'm a 
full blown introvert, right? So the the embarrassment and all those types of fear, it's just as bad, right? It's terrifying for yeah. me. I, I feels like I'm dying. Yeah. You know? So <clears throat> I I tried because I made this career out of two things: speaking and surfing. That I'm both terrified of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought possibly <laughs> there was an answer to being successful here without having to go through all the fear. Mm. Read every piece of literature ever written really? about fear. Every psychologist, psychiatrist successful businessmen, athletes, everyone. And all the books say the same thing. Is experience is the only way you get through fear. And they're spot on. Like you have to do something over and over and mm -hmm. over again to become comfortable, to get the skill set. And then in that once terrifying environment, you feel good, you feel comfortable and you enjoy it, right? Yeah. But getting the experience is scary in itself. So to me, the fundamental part of it is just motivation. Like you have to want it more than you fear it. You got to want to succeed more than you fear doing what it takes to get there. Like that's the fundamental part. So for me, it's creating enough motivation first and foremost, desire, understanding what you're chasing and why you're chasing it. Like you got to create it. Then of course, go out and find out how to do it. Like, like I, I listen to your podcast and that tip of just finding the person who's the best at, at what you want to do uh -huh. and learning from them, right? And then, so you've created the desire and then you take the steps to do what that person's doing. They're going to be scary on the way, but if the desire's there, you'll figure it out. And being as prepared as you can be is so important. That's a Because key. there's that... If you're not prepared, you're going to be fearful of like, yeah. oh, I'm not ready for this. Yeah, and, and there, there's that kind of, I always notice it with myself, the head in the sand approach is when you've got to do something scary, you know it's coming up but you don't want to think about it. So it's you like, do everything yeah, else. <laughs> I'm going to do everything else. I'm going to deal with that on the day. Like mm -hmm. I'm just going to wing it, you know, and that doesn't work. I yeah. mean, it saves you from having to think about it in the moment, but it doesn't work. When you turn up on the day, they're the days you're going to freeze up mm -hmm. and, you know, like not succeed basically. So yeah. the preparation's key and the preparation's hard. Like, you, you know what it's like to speak. I mean, it's you're really extroverted, so it's a little yeah. more natural for you. But mm -hmm. for it's me, learning though. to speak was was harder than big wave surfing mm -hmm. like to be a public speaker standing on stage i had bigger audience so much anxiety in the lead up to doing that it's terrifying yeah but you have to do it to get good at it and yeah. to get comfortable and finally sort of after 10 15 years i'm a whole lot more comfortable at it thankfully right it took a long time and i was like am i ever going to get comfortable at this no, I, I'm not, I don't know like completely no fear but yeah I'm a lot more comfortable and I enjoy it a lot more now too That's because good. I'm comfortable. So. Yeah. I remember when I started speaking 10 years ago, I was terrified to speak in front of like a group of four people yeah. just because I didn't believe in myself and I didn't think I was smart enough and I didn't think I was funny enough or whatever. Mm. Um, and I remember it was just like, I'm sick and tired of feeling like this fear. And a friend who was already a professional speaker recommended going to Toastmasters and he was exactly. like, you just need to go every single week for yeah. a year. And it's going to suck for the first few months. You're going to be miserable. You're going to be horrible there. But just mm. continue to go and you'll get better. And I did that. Every single week I went, practiced, stood in front of the room, like and just felt the pain of embarrassment over and over again. It feels like you're dying. <laughs> so horrible, you're man. Up, man. I would practice for weeks a five-minute speech, write it out word for word, yep. look down at the paper when I was reading it, like just constantly. But every time I would gain a little bit more like – ownership of that fear yeah i was like okay it wasn't that bad i made it through exactly i can go back and try it again yep. and like get a little bit better i think it's again i was just i had the desire that i didn't want to feel embarrassed anymore or yeah. afraid of the of just afraid yeah of speaking in front of people and i want to be able to have some type of way of del delivering a message that people took action on so i think it's that's where you got to have that desire first for sure 100%. otherwise you're not going to do it because it's freaking miserable yeah to go through that fear. It's miserable experience. Yeah. And then, I mean, so what does success look like for you? Like, why did you go and do that? You know what that moment looks like, right? Yeah. For me, I knew that, you know, I was broke. I just got done playing professional football. I got injured, broke my wrist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't sit here on my sister's couch anymore. You know, I was there for a year and a half and I was like, I need to learn some skills to make some money, to figure out how to get a job, to figure out something. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, okay, this is one area of my life where I know that if I become an effective communicator, I can use it in a lot of different areas of my life, so whether I have a job or I've start something or whatever. And I saw it as an opportunity to really just transform the rest of my life, the, the, the capacity to stand in front of an audience and persuade them in taking action in yeah. something. 
in an idea, a thought, and just believing in you, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, I'm 10 years in now, practice a lot. I still feel like I have a lot more to learn For about sure. it, but I don't fear it as much. Yeah. Sometimes I still get nervous, but it's not really as much. It's more fun. Yeah, I feel like it, there's a transition that happens. Is like because it's, it's so more. closely related, yeah, right? Yeah. Ner- nervous and excited is almost mm-hmm. the exact same thing. It's like I feel like excited is when you're prepared. Mm-hmm. So it's like preparation meets nerves, but then it's excitement. If yeah. you're underprepared, it goes nervous and then frees up. So yeah. it's kind of that that transition. Then all of a sudden, you, I I, I start to chase that feeling because now mm-hmm. like. The nerves are excitement, and I know on the other side of that, I'm going to feel amazing. Yeah. So it's almost like you, I did it in surfing, and, uh-huh. and now I want to find that feeling in something else. Right. You know? So I kind of chase it everywhere now. Sure, sure. Which is, it, it's hard. The hard part about it is when you're doing things that are scary over and over again, you break down, right? Mm-hmm. Like there has to be some sort of aspect where you take care of yourself on that road to pushing yourself like right. kind of growth on one level but then you have to support on the other level Absolutely. otherwise you're going to crash and burn and yeah oh, this is what happens <laughs> i'm kind of like the genius in hindsight on this topic right, right, because right. this is where all my injuries come from because i didn't look after myself when i yeah. was sort of pushing myself you know? sure sure how do you stay focused whether it be in your speaking career or on a big wave when there's so many distractions around you, when you've got the cameras, the guy pulling you out, you've got whatever, other surfers around, and you're just trying to get one wave without dying, how do you stay focused, present, and at a peak level with all that happening? Yeah, I, it, it's the prep to get everyone and everything set up perfectly, and then my role is a single role, mm. and I know exactly what that is. It's kind of... I need to get myself on the biggest wave or inside the biggest barrel, right? And and if I do that, the rest of my team, they're going to do what they're there for and we're all going to be successful, right? Mm. So for me, I, I spend the time leading up to those moments focusing more on the outcome, not as much the process, but I, I like to sit and visualize like the feeling of what it's going to feel like either – like sort of in that barrel or or right after it when I come out and, and I just like all that relief comes off you from the fear of riding that wave. And I feel like if, if I visualize that part over and over again, then I'll, I'll naturally make the right decisions in the moment. Sometimes because I'm quite negative, like uh, pessimistic when I, I think about things in the future. So mm-hmm. if I let that sort of mind rattle off, I'll think about all the things that could possibly go wrong in this surf i'll think about wiping out i'll think about the sharks that are swimming around all the dangers and i'll stress myself out but Uh before i even put a foot in the water i'll be exhausted so if i make sure i just focus on the after facts and how good it's going to feel i think i'll I'll make the right decisions in that moment then you just got to sort of let your instinct take over everything in surfing yeah yeah happens so fast can't think too yeah. much it's got to be it happens so fast and most decisions there are all subconscious like mm-hmm. you're not you don't have time to sort of break no. anything down that's just, why yeah it's a lot more of a reactive or... sport <laughs> yeah. yeah super reactive like on the other hand I've been trying to learn how to play golf which is the opposite yes <laughs> it's all complete thought <clears throat> nothing's reactive and it's so much harder yeah. than surfing so. yeah what is uh, what does resilience mean to you and is it the same thing as fearless um Definitely not. I think uh, resilient is feeling the fear, doing it anyway, getting knocked down by the fear, but getting back up, learning from when you get knocked down and doing it again and again and again until you feel comfortable and overcome that fear. That's resilience. Like there is, I don't believe anyone's fearless. I honestly can't imagine. Like you get these phenomenal people that are amazing in their world and they're good at that thing. But if you take them to a foreign environment, mm-hmm. they, they're nervous. Because if it's foreign, it's different, it's change. And, and no one's like that special where they're not nervous in every environment. I yeah. saw Wim Hof on your podcast, for yeah. example. He's amazing. How amazing is that guy, right? He's yeah. phenomenal. The stuff that he's done he's is freak. like, it's not, it's barely humanly possible, yeah. right? Like yeah. he's an anomaly amongst humans, mm-hmm. basically. And then I, so I follow him a lot as well and do a lot of his breathing techniques. And then I saw him give a TED talk and he was like, got the nervous waltz going. 
Like, not saying the talk wasn't amazing, it was phenomenal, right, right. but you can see that he's nervous on that stage. So yeah. it's just, a, it, it's a new world. Yeah. So it's just, to me, it's, you just got to be comfortable in that world and it takes resilience to keep pushing to get there. Mm -hmm. you know? wow. That's why, like, it's kind of, it's, you want to, like, self comparison's good, like, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think it works a lot and that growth mindset, but. Comparing yourself to other people and saying, oh, I'm a scaredy cat compared to that person because he does that stuff, but he might have grown up doing that stuff. Right, it's right. easy for him, you know? Mm -hmm. So you just go, it's better to, it's more motivating to, to just compare to who you were yesterday and right. you get better and better and better and better. And no. eventually everyone will be looking at you thinking, you're right. phenomenal. Right. Um, how do we capture these, these opportunities and moments during high risk situations? How do we make the most of those opportunities? I think it, it is that preparation that we've mm -hmm. been talking about, setting up everything to be agile, like in that moment. I think like it's, even in business, it's the same. People think that like that company or that person or that athlete or that team are just so talented and they can pull anything off in that moment. But in reality, they're so prepared yeah. and so open to change and they've tested all these different things and they've taught themselves <laughs> to react in a certain way that when the moment comes around they react correctly mm -hmm. you know and if it doesn't they make the best out of what happens if it goes pear-shaped and then it seems like they succeed you know yeah. and that's why for me a lot of what i did in surfing was a numbers game i figured if i surfed more big swells than everyone else like I didn't just go to one or two or three that year. I went to 20 big swells. Mm. Then at the end of the day, when the companies look at who's the best big wave surfer in the world, I'd be winning just based on a numbers game. You right. know, They might've been way more talented surfers or guys that were on that day better than me. But overall, when they looked at the exposure, I'd be the one that they thought was the best. You yeah, because so you were everywhere. Yeah. You got a bunch of big waves. So it's kind of creating the moments and then... You know, if it's a numbers thing, then you'll take advantage yeah. enough to be successful. Yeah, I like that. It's kind of like finding a way that you can be the best at something, yeah. even though you're not the best at it. Exactly. Like you're probably definitely, not the best. Yeah. Uh, you haven't done the biggest wave in the world. You're probably hundred percent. Someone's got better technique. Yeah. Maybe someone doesn't crash as much. Someone whatever. might have got lucky on that day and, and exactly. got the biggest wave. Yeah. Or yeah, and they're more genetically gifted. I'm the opposite from genetically gifted to be a surfer. I went recently and did a. Uh, uh, they do a body measurements as part of a physical uh -huh. assessment to make a really specified training program. And I went in and the, the trainer was taking measurements and he got down on my legs and my quads and he took a measurement and he burst out laughing. <laughs> he was like, you're an average human being. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, y you have the exact same size legs as Miss Universe. Oh, wow. Jennifer Hawkins, Australian Miss Universe. I have the exact same size leg. I was born to be a female supermodel. <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a professional surfer. Like right. surfing, you need to be low center of gravity, uh -huh. big stocky legs, balance. So yeah. I just figured I, I'd learn everything else to add to what I was doing. Kind of yeah. surround myself with amazingly talented people, like the best photographers, the best well forecasts. Right, right. The best PR people, the best communication. It, like, and then what Tell I the was story yeah, too. They were taking what I was doing from here to here, and then I was above all the super talented surfers. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of I think branding and storytelling goes a long way as well. Hundred percent. If no one else is branding themselves as like the elite big wave surfer yeah. and have the best photos and getting yeah. the covers, it's like a lot of it's perception. Yeah. I learned yeah. a lot of that from Led. Like yeah, Led was great. amazing at that, and I've heard you talk about it. Like yeah. that branding is so important. It's so kind of tough to do. Like Especially to self do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As an introvert, it feels so awkward. Uh -huh. But um, you just, then I just surround myself with a really good PR person who yeah. can give me feedback or a, a someone at the top of the game in the industry. Right. And, and they, like, I, I was on my way here and uh, I spoke to Lisa, who I do some branding stuff, and, and she's like, make sure you wear a college shirt. You're a professional speaker <laughs> now, you know? Or make sure, like, to make right, right, sure right. I'm doing the right thing. Don't because be a for, bum. Yeah, 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 to me, like, it feels more normal to be a bum. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting, yeah. Cool. Amazing people, like, make what you do a whole lot easier. Yeah. What's some of the biggest lessons you learned from being a surfer that you've applied to life? Um, dealing with fear is, is the main one. Uh, being able to handle... Um, change and diversity because surfing is just non-stop change mm -hmm. and like a swell you're trying to forecast it you might forecast it wrong 
on the day it's bigger than you thought or smaller than you thought you got to make the most of the situation didn't go your way you got to get ready to go the next way and you just like everything we do is super fluid from riding the wave like you have to be agile enough to change with what the wave's going to do you can't know right. exactly what it's going to do every time and then everything about it is just constantly changing so yeah being agile enough and not rigid in the way mm. you do what you do yeah. is, is super important hard yeah. to do because we're naturally like habitual creatures that that want to do everything the way we did it yesterday you know we sure i heard a funny quote that people have sixty thousand thoughts a day mm. and 90 percent of those thoughts are exactly the same as yesterday really yeah so you have non-stop that you think the same way right. unless you forcefully change it you know and then create a sort of new thinking pattern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think being fluid and being able to adapt to change, which yeah. has helped me in business as well as, sure. as surfing and speaking and everything. Is there anything that speaking has taught you about how to be a better surfer? Dealing with the stress, definitely. Yeah, the lead up to um, speaking is terrifying for me. And uh, taking techniques that I learned from not getting really stuck in that negative thought chatter in your head in the lead up to speaking. So you can, I can think nonstop for 24 hours a day about how I'm going to stuff up on stage, freeze up, no one's going to like it and your career is going to go down the shot. I can just think about that all the time. But learning to switch off from that, you can't stop the thoughts, but do things that take enough focus and you enjoy enough to not get caught up thinking about that. Yeah. There's that moment where if you dwell on those thoughts long enough, they create the physical reaction in your body and then your body becomes stressed. Tight. Heart rate goes up, yeah. tight. You get the shoulders lifted. Can't get in the flow. Yeah, yeah, and eventually you break down. Like it's a big part of that, managing the long-term sort of sustainability of your performance. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've found all the the techniques that that are out there are really good, but you've got to find the ones that work for you. So like yoga is amazing. Meditation is amazing, but they might not suit you. So find your hobby or something that you love doing that's not super taxing, but takes you out of that negative mm -hmm. thought process so that you get a break from that, you know? Yeah. Because it's really hard to just stop that. It's kind right. of really ingrained. Right. And do you have a ritual or routine in the morning when you go after a big wave when it's like we flew to... Tasmania or here is there a process you do the fir in that morning or yeah. the first hour what and what is that I mean the lead up in the week I'm playing golf or doing something to not think too much right. about it I'm yeah. preparing for a couple of hours a morning getting everything sorted but then doing stuff to not think too much to relax. about it relax Stay exactly loose to yeah. Be, yeah um the hour of the morning I'll sit probably for not even an hour 10 minutes and remind myself why I'm doing it like I, I actually built an app for my phone that's an alarm clock, right? So it wakes me up in the morning and plays a slideshow with my favorite song of all the reasons I'm doing this for. Like a video or yeah, image slideshow? Yeah, a show. video slideshow. And it's just play and I see it, I watch it, and it reminds me to do it because on the morning like of a huge swell, I'm tired, I'm jet lagged. You don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. 100% don't want to do it. I would love to stay in bed. Don't want to get injured, like, risk yeah. your life. Yeah. I don't want to bob around in water where there's great whites <laughs> swimming around below me. Like I'm terrified of this stuff. But I know that when I do go out and do it, when I ride that wave, it's going to feel the best feeling in the world. It's going to be successful for my career. It's going to make me be able to support my family. Like all these things I look at and focus on consistently. You know, people say motivation doesn't work and it, it, it's taxing, but you just got to force yourself to do it. It's like training. Mm. So the hour in the lead up in the mornings before I go and surf, that's what I have to do. You watch that video. Get, get myself out of bed, eat relatively light. Like I can't have mm -hmm. super full no. stomach when you're rolling around uh, underwater. So never eat fish too. I've got this paranoid thing. I'm like, if I eat fish, it's going to be fish in me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's something that's not fish, but um, yeah. And then some breathing techniques, really good. Like to energize myself, mm -hmm. get me in that sort of positive frame of mind. And it, it gets you in the zone, you know, with Wim Hof's breathing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Laird does it. And uh, just get myself to that point where I'm feeling really good and excited about surfing. And then we get out there, assess the situation for a couple of hours not even a couple, probably about an hour, like go around, see mm -hmm. what the sets are doing, what direction the waves are coming from, where we got to position ourselves, where the photographer should be mm. to capture the best stuff. Do all of that and then 
go and surf and then at that point it's less thinking and just what just happens, get out happens. There and get out there and, and enjoy it yeah, yeah enjoy it in that moment so wow. I, I found that if i'm out in the surf and thinking too much about i need to be the biggest one on the uh, like if i i need to get a photo to get the sponsors happy if i'm thinking about that while i'm actually surfing the performance is not good mm -hmm. in that moment it's just wow this is amazing yeah so excited i can feel the ocean i know what's happening and it's more that flow state, you know. Yeah, Don't yeah. think too much, just react. No. Is there anything else about fear that you think we should hear about your process or how you um, think about it or how we can overcome it or embrace it or any other thing that you have to include about it? I think uh, just for people, like, don't try and find that one thing that's going to help you. Like, find you, there's a, I think performance and performance is a whole part of dealing with fear. It's like it's like an amazing song, right? It has multiple pieces to it. To make an amazing song, you need a really good drum beat. You need a really good bass. You need an amazing hook or lead guitar, and you need vocals. You need multiple factors to make an amazing performing song, right? It's exactly the same in human performance. You need to look at the different areas of your life, whether it's the, the physical aspect, diet and exercise. You need to look at the emotional side, like how well do you work emotionally? Do you understand the way you react, the way other people react? You got to take time on that. You got to take time on your network and your relationships, and you need to do something in each of these quadrants. And and of course the IQ side of what you do, how are you going to be successful? Do one little thing mm -hmm. in each of those quadrants, then the snowball happens. Do one thing. It sounds like a real average song. You just listen to drum beats. It's kind of cool, but do all of them, you got an amazing song. Yeah. You know? So that's, I think, don't look for the one thing. Just make a few small changes. Eat good, eat a, a little bit better. Do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and then the performance comes. So optimize your performance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Anything else you want to share? Anything else on your mind? Um, I'm in rehab at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. The doctors have said I won't surf big waves again i'm telling them i will and I, I told them if if you don't think i can then chop my leg off i'll surf on a pole because i've seen surfers ride with amputees really yeah i said if you don't think it's going to get better chop it off at the knee and i can surf Shut on up. a pole. yeah <laughs> but they said it's going to be better than that and i said well then i can surf so i'm uh in the process of rehabbing that i'm hoping i'm back this time next year if not late season november in hawaii surfing decent sized waves yeah. this year yeah Next year, no, next November year. next year. So like a yeah. year and a few a months. A year, one more operation and then a year and a few yeah, months. Yeah, probably rest it. If you want to follow the uh, journey, I'm on Instagram or my site, markmatthews.com. So markmatthews.com. Follow Mark, the journey. It'll be interesting and see if I can make it back. On Instagram as well? Uh, at Mark Matthews Surf on Instagram. Okay, yeah. cool. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, do you have any questions for me before I ask the final few questions? Uh, well, why don't we break down? I mean, this is that performance model for me. So mm -hmm. why don't you give some, because I watch all the podcasts. I want to know how you got to the point that you are, like where you get to that successful. So if mm -hmm. you can give us what's something that you do in the IQ space, like the mental side of what you do to know mm -hmm. how to be successful. Yeah. Like a tip there, a tip on the relationship front, the networking. A tip on physical, what do you do physically mm -hmm. to stay in good shape? And then, so mental, physical, and emotionally, like gratitude. or Yeah, like I think the, the some um, tips from you would be amazing for sure. me. Sure, I mean, I don't think it's much different. And I think a lot of people are always looking for the secret weapon or something, but I think mm -hmm. it's like the more simplified you can be, the more effective you can be. I'm always looking for ways to be more aware of what what's working for me and what's mm -hmm. not working. Yeah. So it's just more of like awareness. Yeah. First off, like being, good aw self -assessment of being aware of like, oh, my ego's flaring up in this situation. Mm -hmm. I wasn't listening here. Mm -hmm. I'm not patient here. Okay, I'm aware. So mm -hmm. it's the first step is That's to be aware. That's emotional intelligence yeah. right being there. Being aware yeah. and then being like, okay, what can I improve in my, you know, my reactions or my, my ego or whatever it may be in that situation? Maybe I was triggered in something in mm -hmm. business or a personal relationship or intimate relationship. So how can I be patient in that and moving forward so yeah. that I don't feel this negative reaction and yeah. don't cause this argument or whatever it may be? So first step is being aware and then figuring yeah. out, okay, what can I work on moving forward in that situation? Mm. In terms of a mental, I would say it's preparing myself every single day for what's to come. Yeah. So visualizing and med through meditation in the morning, 
of the perfect day that I want to create. Mm -hmm. And it's thinking about what do I want to have happen today? What are the experiences? What are the relationship conversations? What are the feelings I want to have? Kind of like when you drop in that wave. What do I want to experience in my business? When I go to that meeting later, what's going to happen? What's the outcome? What do I like? Yeah. And that's also, where it's transitioning, right? Because mm-hmm. you're setting yourself. It's like going to the gym in the morning, but for your mind. Yeah, setting it. your day up. Mind gym, man. Yeah. It's huge. And then being self-aware, creating mm-hmm. that emotional intelligence. Exactly. So physically, what diet, exercise. What, well, I, what I think doing? also, uh, you know, thinking about the dream that I have for the day mm-hmm. and then setting the intention, saying, okay, this is what I'm intending to create. Mm-hmm. And really being intentional and grounded in why I want to create yeah. that. There's direction exactly. and inspiration. And always coming back to like my bigger vision and purpose, my why. So while you do this like little video in the morning, yeah. I'm thinking about, okay, I want to impact 100 million people. Why do I want to do that? And just kind of leaning into that. How amazing is it when it's something external, how much more motivating it is or how much easier it is to push through that bit of fear? So like much if you're like, more. you can help yeah. you know, 100,000 people today yeah. by making yourself a little bit uncomfortable. That's it. Yeah. yeah. When you do something, when I do something that's bigger than myself, I feel like it's much more rewarding. Mm. If it's just for me, then it's not as fulfilling. Mm. The physical side, uh, yeah, I mix it up all the time, but I try to do something to put myself through pain every day. Mm-hmm. It could be a yoga, it could yeah. be a hit workout, it could be a for run sure. for three miles, it could be anything. It could be something in my bedroom where I'm just doing a bunch of you know push-ups yeah. until f- a failure. Yeah. Whatever it is, I'm trying to put myself through pain, even just for a few moments, mm-hmm. because that's going to train my mind to be able to take on more pain throughout the day or any type of Situation. aggressive thoughts, situations, yeah. fear. I've taken on a little bit, so I've... Uh, train my body and my heart to experience it when it comes and yep. not be affected by it as much. 100%. So I do something every single day. I try to every day to do that. It definitely transitions when you do uh-huh. that physically, uh-huh. feel the pain, push through yeah. it. You're going to be the exactly same way mentally. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so all these things for me build up uh, the amount of energy that you have to assess situations mm-hmm. and experiences every single moment mm-hmm. and to be able to perform at a high level. And the last thing. Network. Where, like, how are you You're sitting on the plane with Tony Robbins? Yeah, and yeah. Tim Ferriss. And Before I get to network, let's talk about the <laughs> relationship. Let's or... talk about food because. Ah, uh, yeah, diet exercise. I think yeah. uh, our body is, you know, made up of these cells. And if we're feeding our body uh, poison, then we're, we're developing this aggressive, toxic, cancerous experience in our energy and our mm-hmm. physiology and our body. And when we do that, it's really hard to have full engagement throughout the day 100%. and get in the zone yeah. because our body is drained to a level we're performing at 70% as opposed to potentially 100%. So it's how can we capitalize on each area with the food? And recently I cut out all sugar, refined exact sugar, same thing. all dairy, all gluten. Yep. And it's like I just feel different. You know, everywhere in my body I just feel different yeah. and I feel – also like emotionally good because I'm doing something positive for my body. Hundred I'm not perfect. I'm sure I'm going to, you know, cheat every now and then, but it's like, what would happen if I actually eliminated that for the rest of my life? Like how much younger would I feel? How much more energy would I have? All hundred percent. You just added 20 years right? to your exactly. life for one thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, on the relationship side of things, it's always about how can I, how can I come from such a place of giving and love and support first as opposed to ever asking anything first. Mm-hmm. So I'm always thinking of like, you know, I think we're always in a relationship for selfish reasons mm-hmm. because we like the person, because we want to be friends with them, because we like who they for are, sure. because they yeah. make us feel a certain way, because maybe it's a business relationship where mm-hmm. you can you make money together. Mm-hmm. Every relationship is for selfish reasons. Yeah. But I think if we can come to the relationship and saying, I'm not trying to do this to gain, but I'm trying to do this to give first. And maybe one day something good will come in return if it's a business relationship. Mm-hmm. That's the way I think about it. I've been building relationships for eight, nine, ten years that haven't really paid off and like benefiting me in a in a big way. And I didn't go into them trying to think of like I'm gonna do something for them and then they're gonna give me something in return. Mm-hmm. It always seems to work its way out. Like the more that I give year after year after year without ever asking for things, people just want to give back. They're it's just like, How can so I support true. you? Like, you've helped me so much, what can I do? And when it makes sense, I'm like, you know, well, here's my book. It's coming out or here's something else. But I never try to just ask all the time. I try to really give a lot. So That's I think such an interesting story. When we come That's from really that cool. mindset of like I'm building this relationship for life as opposed to what can I gain from this person right now, it changes 
the the game for you. Yeah. So come from that place. So those are some of the things that I try to do that have that I think have helped me get to the level I'm at, and I am gonna continue to develop new things to get to higher levels. Yeah. So I love it, and you can see how they all cross over. Like yeah. You eat well, you feel better, and then That's you're it. nicer to people, and you're nicer to people, and the relationships happen, and That's it. and they teach you more, and it all yeah. just like snowballs if you do something little. Yeah. That's it. I love that. You know, I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes every day, but it's always trying we to be aware do. of like, okay, all right, how can I get better tomorrow? Mm. And I think if we look at that uh, point of view of how can I just get a little bit better tomorrow, be aware of the things that worked and that didn't work, then it's all going to work out. Yeah. So um, let's go to a uh, final couple questions for you. Uh, this is called the three truths. So if, uh, you know, it was your last day many years from now, you got to achieve everything you ever wanted to achieve. You got to have the life you dreamed of. It all happened. Uh, and But it's your last day, and you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down three things you know to be true about every lesson you've ever had, from big wave surfing to relationships to speaking to anything you want to do in the future. But it all boils down to three lessons, three truths. And this is what you'd be remembered by. What would give you, you one. <laughs> what would be three? Um, life short. <laughs> that's and and I'm plagued by this but I feel like it's so motivating it happens non-stop to me I'm like whoa that 10 years just went really quick mm -hmm. I don't want to die full of regret so I just think life short we've got a limited amount of time on this planet make the most out of it yeah. uh, life short don't take everything too seriously I mean it, because life short well, don't worry about stupid things especially in the in the fear realm of the, the egoic fear, like not the, you got to take the serious stuff when it's about getting injured or dying, but the egoic side, don't take everything seriously. Mm -hmm. man. You're going to one day lying on your deathbed and you'll be like, I can't believe I was so worried about that or I can't believe I didn't try to do that because I was embarrassed or yeah. scared in that way. So life short, don't take everything too seriously and uh, eat well, like you said, eat well, man. It's... I did the exact same thing you did. And I've never been one to be super focused on diet. I kind of like, oh, I can get away with it. I do lots of exercise. Mm -hmm. I can eat whatever. But you start to break down. And when you start to break down physically, that's where everything else falls apart. And that's why I get all the injuries and stuff. And I've learned if there's one thing you can do diet-wise, is sugar. Get rid of it. And it's surprising how amazing it makes you feel. So, feels so much better. Yeah. yeah. There's... Those three things, um, I wouldn't leave out family and just yeah, yeah. be good to your family and friends is super important too. So I got four. Cheated. That's cool. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, well, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Mark, for your courage, man. You've got this um, amazing story uh, and you, you could have gone down a negative path when you were younger. You went down a positive path to inspire others, to be there for your family and to do things that bring inspiration to so many young kids probably growing up who want to do what you're doing. So your courage, your humility of being, you know, one of the biggest surfers in the world, but still being this humble uh, person that's grateful for all the things that you've achieved and the people that have supported you, your team, and your ability to smile and be grateful through all the pain and uh, the discomfort and the, you know, the challenges you've faced. For me, it's a great example of how to live a good life so i want to acknowledge you for those things man thank you so much yeah and it feels uh, great <laughs> good good uh <laughs> final you. question for you uh, and people can connect with you at markmatthews.com is that yep. right matthews one t that's matthews one t mark matthews surf on instagram um you speak so if people want to hire you to speak they can learn more at your site yeah. um no book yet right it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. I feel coming. like um, I'm more. I learn so much of amazing people. I'd rather just direct them. It's sure, like, sure. So when people want to know about all these things, I say, Lewis Howes, man, there go to his <laughs> thing. Join the school of greatness. There you go. You can learn, or this dude for diet, or yeah. this dude for. I just pass it on. Sure, man. sure, yeah. cool. Um, well, final question is: What's your definition of greatness? Uh, being better than who you were yesterday is for me greatness because that feels amazing. Yeah. yeah. Don't don't. Less external comparison. Just compare yourself to who you were yesterday and mm. be better than that person. There you That's go. That's greatness. Mark Matthews, thanks, man. Thank Appreciate you so you. much. It's, it's been great. fun. That's great.